All right. I'm very glad to be joined on Bad Faith Podcast by Margaret Kimberly, the executive editor of the Black Agenda Report. Welcome to Bad Faith. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, I was saying before we started rolling that it's long overdue for many reasons, one of which is that I think that, you know, the Black Agenda Report is an underappreciated resource to the left. Mm -hmm. So for folks who aren't initiated, what's it all about? Uh, Black Agenda Report, we've we've been around since 2006, and uh, we uh, provide uh, news and analysis from a Black left perspective, an emphasis on left. We're not Democrats, we're not uh, um, liberals, we are leftists. And, uh, but we always emphasize uh, uh, Black people here in this country and around the world and uh, our situation, but we analyzed always as leftists. Margaret, I'm told that Black leftists don't even really exist. (laughs) (laughs) How convenient. I know, what a convenient thing to say that we aren't here. But, you know, this is a a tradition among Black people. We traditionally were the most left-leaning group of people in the country. That has changed somewhat with the rightward shift in general, Mm. uh, the fact that uh, Black people are uh, trapped or feel trapped by the duopoly and think uh, that uh, Democrats have to be supported no matter what. But in general, that has been our political tradition is to uh, have a left wing point of view. I think we are still um, the most left, although that, as I just said, has changed somewhat over time. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I wonder if you have any particular insight about what's going on there, I, I, you know, with the the black vote and what you think are the likely, likely outcomes as we head into the 2024 season. Of course, there's been reporting about how a majority of Biden voters would prefer for him not to run again. There seems to be a lack of enthusiasm around his candidacy for many reasons, including his age. Of course, Donald Trump is similarly facing um, low favorability numbers, and it feels a lot like we're heading into a kind of 2016 um, lesser of two evils realm again. There was a lot of talk, as you pointed to, in 2016 of Trump having gotten a incrementally larger uh, slice of the black vote and doing much better with Latinos than other um, conservatives had typically done. Uh, And of course, in 2020, there was this feeling that Joe Biden running in the middle of the George Floyd uh, protests didn't really bend the knee, didn't really seem to give any concessions to black folks. But the threat of Trump, even in the middle of that um, protest movement, was enough to get most people to fall in line. Do you anticipate anything different happening this time around? Uh, sadly, no, mm-hmm. I don't. You know, this uh, this duopoly trap for Black people uh, makes people think that they don't have choices. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody forgets. Uh, everyone wants to lift up the liberation movement, the, the civil rights movement, but no one mentions what it was that happened. People mobilized independently of political parties, made demands that they knew the system did not want to meet. Uh, But they did it anyway. And uh, the great changes that we did see in this country came about because of that popular mobilization. But that movement was crushed. Uh, People were uh, propagandized. Well, the movement was crushed, first of all. And then we were, there was a buffer class created, the Congressional Black Caucus and so on. So there seemed to be a place for us politically although it's uh, on the surface. So, um, and as Republicans moved further and further to the right, there was a greater and greater allegiance to Democrats, even as we saw conservative Democrats like Bill Clinton. Uh, Barack Obama, where do we start with people (laughs) thinking they couldn't even question him? But Joe Biden, there was no enthusiasm for him in 2020. Mm -hmm. But the the Democratic Party oligarchs, yes, we have oligarchs in this country, got behind him. They got everybody else to drop out. They deep six Bernie Sanders campaign and black people were told this is it. This is your guy. This is your only choice. And by the way, look, Trump. So I think and with Trump running again, uh, I think we're, we are unfortunately going to see a repeat of that where people don't like Biden or aren't enthusiastic or have levels ranging from disappointment to strong opposition. But most will, uh, if they vote, will vote for him again. 
Do you think there's ever going to be a tipping point? Can you imagine a world in which the Democrats are so kind of flagrant in their disrespect of working class voters and black voters in particular that they would ever be willing to say, I'm just not doing this anymore, even if it means that a Trump, a Trumpian candidate or Trump himself might win? Because we did see, we saw that leaked video where Biden sat down with all of the civil rights mm-hmm. leaders in the fall of 2020 and was so disrespectful to even the most moderate of mm-hmm. um, asks that was brought, that were brought up by um, uh, uh, Sherilyn Eiffel, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was absolutely, but there was barely any coverage of it. And to the extent that there, there was coverage, people like April Ryan covered it as an indictment of the leaker and said, oh, we got to find the person who leaked this tape, um, yeah. you know, covering for Joe Biden. And there was very little scrutiny of what he actually said or the failure to pass a George Floyd Justice and C- Policing Act as meager as that was. Um, do, do you think there's ever, if, if that didn't do it, if there's something that would actually do it? Well, part of the problem is you and you mentioned the coverage. There's collusion between the Biden administration and corporate media. So this spin is always in favor of him. So Mm -hmm. they will, for example, I'll just say it. The Biden administration blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Mm -hmm. They did it. But the New York Times will not even mention that a former correspondent of theirs wrote a 5000 word article explaining how it was done. So it's that kind of thing that that coverage, the covering up that he has. So the railroad workers, they went through this whole drama about how they got the best deal they could and there was nothing else they could do. And the sick leave, which was the uh, sticking point, he could give them sick leave with an executive order. Right. But nobody said that in the major papers, the networks, cable news, none of them. No one said any of that. And I think that's a huge problem uh, uh, with media consolidation. Thank you, Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are fewer and fewer uh, places where and most people still rely on corporate media. But if they cover up everything, it's more difficult for people to know about their options, for people to know what he didn't, uh, uh, what he did do, what he didn't do. I mean, he did take a knee during 2020, but everybody did. There were cops taking a knee. There were CEOs taking a knee. So yeah, what? They they had the whole Congress in uh, kente cloth yes. <laughs> oh, get-ups on a knee being gingerly held back to their feet because, uh, unfortunately, we also have a, I mean, a gerontocracy. Not that it, I think it's a problem across the board to have older right. statesmen, but the fact that there is just, it, it's reflective of a failure to allow anyone else to come up the ranks is, of course, the problem there. I mean, you, you make this, I think, really important critique of what's been going on in the media sphere and how mm-hmm. the media's failure to report on the failures of the Biden administration and the Democratic mm-hmm. Party more broadly is part of why there is relatively little pushback from Black folks or other predominantly working class groups who are being disproportionately disadvantaged by the uh, current political system. Um, We are recording this on the heels of some pretty big news breaking about Tucker Carlson leaving Fox (laughs) News. Now, they are it's being reported as they are parting ways. I'm sure we're going to learn more about the actual circumstances of this. Uh, The Washington Post is reporting that uh, the reason uh, for his departure has something to do with the Dominion uh, voting lawsuit. Not that uh, the lawsuit, of course, settled for just shy of eight hundred million dollars. But apparently some of the comments that Tucker Carlson made about management bristled management. And that is why he's being let go. And some people are celebrating this. Predictably, the View audience cheered uh, his departure. Some others like Glenn Greenwald have pointed out that his coverage, although he disagrees with much of it, um, has been one of the few opportunities on cable news to talk about the injustice that's been done to Julian Assange, uh, Mm -hmm. have a critique of um, endless wars, of the Ukraine proxy war, et cetera. What what do you make of this in in the early days of this of this news? Well, the thing that I find most interesting is that people like Tucker Carlson become this lightning rod. I mean, and that's how he sold himself, frankly. But I feel like people on the left pay too much attention to people like him. Mm. Uh, he is lifted up as this boogeyman. There's all, If there's a Democrat in the White House, there's always a, a right-wing boogeyman or boogeywoman like Marjorie Taylor Greene, for mm. example. 
um, who we are told are the enemy. They're the worst things. They're, they are our problem. Uh, Fox News is so terrible. But I, I, I question that. I question the emphasis um, that's uh, given to him and to people like him. I don't think Fox News is worse than MSNBC. Mm. I really don't. I, I think that they are similarly untruthful. They will at time collude with the state on uh, certain issues. And uh, uh, a lot of the outrage about Tucker Carlson, I believe, is misplaced. And I think some of it's virtue signaling. Mm. So I don't care that he's off the air, but I didn't care when he was on the air. And yes, he did. He allowed people to come on who couldn't get a hearing otherwise in corporate media. Um and that is an indictment of the media that uh, uh, some of the people Glenn Greenwald uh, talked about could be on Tucker Carlson's show, but be ignored by NPR or the Washington Post or the New York Times. But Fox is a conservative network. It will still be the conservative network. They'll find somebody else who doesn't have the, the baggage he had with this case. And uh, I suspect the, uh, that slot will be pretty much the same as it was before uh, this uh, uh, departure, as they're you, you calling You think they're it. going to go ahead and replace Tucker Carlson with another Tucker Carlson-like figure? Because the thing about Fox News is that more so, I would argue, than MSNBC or CNN, there is a significant amount of ideological diversity on some pretty big issues over at the station. There are there, your more blob-centered, typical Republican talking points on 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 war types of pundits over there and then there are the more like proto you know you know populist Tucker Carlson um Trump supporting ones we you know there's been endless reporting of course about how hard Fox News tried to kill the Trump phenomenon back in 2016 they didn't want to be on the Trump change train they were kind of strong arm to being on the Trump train. And so much of what came out of the Dominion lawsuit was the extent to which people liked Tucker Carlson. He said he hated uh, Donald Trump, but was invested in the network's need to continue to be a pro-Trump network because that's what was uh, making shareholders happy and making the network very prof profitable. And that difference between his inside perspective and his public perspective on the show very much catering to Donald Trump, very much bending the knee to Donald Trump in that recent interview, among other interviews, um, is part of why uh, Fox was so exposed from a liability perspective in the Dominion lawsuit. So is do you do you think it's likely that they're going to replace Tucker with another Tucker style reporter, journalist? Or do you think they're going to say, oh, good riddance, he caused us so much trouble. Let's get someone who is more likely to toe the kind of State Department line on some of these big issues? Well, I, I, but I think that was part of his appeal that they would allow him, as you as you pointed out, they would allow him to, uh, uh, to be different, to divert from the official narrative sometimes with some people, and uh, so I think they will find someone else like, like that mm. who still is a, a, more of a hard right figure overall. So I think it was a winning formula with him. And so I suspect they are um, uh, going to do that again. But I, I think it's interesting, as you pointed out, nobody wanted Trump in 2016 except the millions of people who voted for him. The Republican right. establishment didn't want him. And that's, of course, Fox News. They still don't want him, but they've got a problem. And uh, he got 10 million more votes in 2020 than he got in 2016. Um, and I suspect uh, he's lost some popularity. He's a polarizing figure, very problematic. But there's still millions of people who like him and uh, and who would vote for him again. So I don't think they're going to diverge that much from their overall politics. You know, it, it's it's interesting that you, 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 this media critique piece, just so we could stay here for a second, because uh, RFK Jr. Uh, made a statement and Lee Fong also on Twitter echoed this this argument that what might have put Tucker over the line for Fox management was that this is quoting Lee Fong. La uh, Tucker Carlson last week ripped big pharma spending hundreds of millions of dollars on TV ads and news outlets routinely parroting drug industry talking points. Is there a single example of a CNN, MSNBC or other Fox news host ever discussing TV advertising corruption? And um, our Robert F. Kennedy also tweeted that 
Tucker Carlson five days after he crosses the line by acknowledging that the TV networks pu pushed a deadly and ineffective vaccine to please their pharma advertisers. Tuck uh, Carlson's breathtakingly courageous April 19th monologue broke TV's two, two biggest rules. You know, what do you make of this argument that maybe this is all smoke and mirrors for the fact that Tucker, Tucker Carlson was too truthful, that Tucker Carlson went too far in actually um, threatening the business by talking about advertisers? I don't think so. You know, that I think that's more about uh, uh, Kennedy and his emphasis on uh, uh, his uh, opposition to uh, uh, the COVID jabs. Um, I think it's more about what he emphasizes as a person. I think this is about the lawsuit. I, mm -hmm. It's about Dominion um, more than anything else. Uh, they would they would allow him to, you know, talk about big. I mean, that's that's red meat for their viewers. Right. Big Pharma's forcing us to get this jab. Yeah. But the advertiser piece, the idea that yeah. the, the network is complicit because they are happy to accept these advertising dollars right. and, and complicit in conforming their news, their news content so that it doesn't undermine the advertiser's best wishes. Right. 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 I I. So, I don't know. It doesn't strike me. I mean, it could be possible, but it doesn't strike me as uh, the thing that would uh, get. The, I mean, his show was the highest rated show. Right. It doesn't strike me as a, the sort of thing that would uh, cause him to lose his job altogether. I. Yeah. It just doesn't. Uh, I'm I'm not feeling it. So. Yeah. There have been these <laughs> other speak. moments, too. Right. Where he's um, he's lost advertisers he's he's covered topics that have caused advertisers to flee fox and what we saw were there were like a small number of ideologically aligned advertisers like the my pizza guy and the papa john's guy i think who were willing to step up and cover the spread for fox news until the advertisers returned so they were basically willing to front the money for tucker carlson to say what he wanted to say and even after those scandals tucker carlson remained afloat so i think that is that is more evidence at least that it's unlikely that the um kind of the pharma screed of april 19th was the one that did it well here's one measure of their badness you can try this at home ask yourself is any news organization you know of so corrupt that it's willing to hurt you on behalf of its biggest advertisers? Anyone who do that is obviously Pablo Escobar level corrupt and should not be trusted. What would that look like? That level of corruption? Well, imagine that the Trump administration had made it mandatory for American citizens to buy my pillow. That's one of Fox News' biggest advertisers. Imagine the administration declared that if you didn't rush out and buy at least one my pillow, and then at least another booster pillow, you would not be allowed to eat out. You couldn't re-enter your own country. You couldn't have a paying job. My pillow, they told you with a straight face, was the very linchpin of our country's public health system. Now imagine as they told you that, that Fox, as a news organization, endorsed it, amplified the government's message. Imagine if Fox News attacked anyone who refused to buy my pillow as an ally of Russia, as an enemy of science. And then imagine that Fox kept up those libelous attacks, even as evidence mounted that my pillow caused heart attacks, fertility problems, and death. If Fox News did that, what would you think of Fox News? Would you trust us? Of course you wouldn't. You would know that we were liars. Thank heaven, Fox News never did anything like that. But the other channels did. The other channels took hundreds of millions of dollars from big pharma companies. And then they shilled for their sketchy products on the air. And as they did that, they maligned anyone who was skeptical of those products. At the very least, this was a moral crime. It was disgusting, but it was universal. It happened across the American news media. They all did it. So at this point, the question isn't who in public life is corrupt, too many to count. The question is, who is telling the truth? One other thing I want to ask you about this. Ben Norton, a uh, journalist, tweeted, uh, tweeted this. Reminder that Tucker Carlson applied to join the CIA, traveled to Nicaragua to support CIA's fascist Contra death squads, is son of head of CIA propaganda front, uh, constantly lobbies for war on China, supports uh, colonialist Monroe Doctrine in Latin America. You know, been there really pushing back against the framing that some have had that, you know, for all of his faults, at least he's anti-war. Do you think there's something there to the idea that some conservatives, including Tucker, have been willing to be anti-war with respect to Russia, Ukraine, but have very much beat the drums of war with respect to China. Oh, that's absolutely true. And and so we have to be careful 
Uh, we can't elevate these people who uh, criticize the, the U.S. It's a proxy war against Russia, the U.S. proxy war uh, in Ukraine, because many of them say, well, the war we really should be having is with China. So uh, you can't call yourself anti-war because you say, well, this dispute isn't the war I want. I want this war over here. So that is correct. And and I think Ben Norton makes a, a very good point, you know, because um, uh, Tucker Carlson had guests, people I respect and like and know who were able to bring up uh, things about um, uh, the uh, a conspiracy to say Syria gassed people, for example, or or talk about some other things that just are not allowed anywhere else in corporate media. That's true, he did, but at the end of the day, he was on board for uh, what I think the right wants more than anything else, and that is to confront China. Well, let's talk about that, because you recently wrote an article for Black Agenda Report titled Chinese Police Stations and War Propaganda. What, what is this article about? And maybe you should start by filling us in on what this Chinese police station story was all about for the uninitiated. Sure. The uh, um, Chinese government has these, they call them service centers, and places where there's a significant Chinese population, and they say they help people with the uh, getting their driver's license, which is an ID card, um, uh, and, and things like that. But uh, uh, other people say they're used for surveillance against uh, uh, dissidents. They're used to spy on people inside and outside of the Chinese community. So we keep hearing about these police stations. You know, when I think of a police station, I think of a lockup and people with guns. But anyway, these are offices. This particular uh, uh, office in New York, in uh, New York's uh, uh, original Chinatown in Lower Manhattan. It closed last fall, but um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were two men indicted. They are U.S. citizens, but uh, of Chinese origin. And uh, they were uh, accused of being foreign agents. As people may know about the Foreign Agent Registry Act, if you work on behalf of a government, you have to tell the U.S. government that you're doing so. And uh, it, it seems to me it's a bit flimsy, the case. And I believe, frankly, if they had exercised their right not to talk to the FBI, they probably never would have been indicted. But um, uh, this was seen as a uh, the, just the latest salvo uh, against China, that China stealing secrets, spying on people. TikTok is spying on you. Um, I, I'm sure your, your viewers saw those terrible hearings about uh, TikTok, which were uh, just a, it was like a parody. It was like a mm -hmm. comedy sketch, except uh, sketch, except it's true that uh, the U.S. see many people in the U.S. see China as the enemy. But as I always point out a couple of things, number one, when the U.S. deindustrialized, they sent all of um, uh, these manufacturing industries and jobs to China. And they were supposed to just make cheap stuff to sell at Walmart. And, you know, that's why they helped them get in the World Trade Organization. And that was supposed to be it. They took the ball, ran with it, and now have the second largest economy in the world. Some people say they have equaled or surpassed the U.S. Um, and because they're not white, I, I'm convinced racism is part of the issue that China has been demonized uh, so much. But there's nothing to do at this point except work with China. They're, the only solution for China, for Russia, is for the U.S. to learn to peacefully coexist with other countries. But apparently they don't see that as being possible. So there has to be a ratcheting up of tension, uh, this rhetoric. Uh, Biden himself, during the State of the Union, that strange tirade he went on against mm -hmm. Xi Jinping, uh, who wants to be like Xi Jinping? But in the past two years, democracies have become stronger, not weaker. Autocracy has grown weaker, not stronger. Name me a world leader who changed places with Xi Jinping. Name me one. Name me one. Well, meanwhile, every world leader is going to Beijing. Macron was just there. President Lula of Brazil was just there. Uh, other leaders are going to talk to Xi Jinping, who... Thanks to his own stupidity, Biden literally can't get on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken was supposed to have meetings in China, and they said, no, actually, don't bother coming. So the U.S. has this rival, uh, an economic rival, but it's done. It's over. The U.S. cannot diminish China's economic prowess. It cannot be done. But we have people who want a hot war against China. And that's why I think uh, when you see stories about Chinese police, any story about China, you should be at the very least extremely skeptical of. Well, I, I mean, this this pushing for a hot war, it seems evident by the framing of any number of instances, the uh, Pelosi trip to uh, Taiwan, et cetera. But it does confuse me, apart from the kind of saber rattling, what the end game is there. Uh, you know, is, is this purely a game of chicken or is there an actual uh, in, plan to engage a hot war with such a powerful, populous country that doesn't end in complete and total disaster for all involved, for, for the globe? Well, I, I say this. They want to turn Taiwan into the next Ukraine and we see how Ukraine has ended up. Uh, and the other crazy thing is that there is still officially a one China policy, which uh, says that Taiwan is part of China. But the U.S. has used Taiwan to undermine China, uh, given uh, um, uh, money to uh, uh, Taiwanese political groups who want to be independent. They've been doing this sort of thing undercover for many years, but allowing Nancy Pelosi to go. Um, uh, all of those things are crossing China's red lines. And I fear they will do what they did in Ukraine to instigate something uh, to say, now we can sanction China or they can send troops to Taiwan. But we see what happened in Ukraine. There is now this, um, I mean, it's been going on for a year. Thousands of people are dead. Ukraine has, I believe, permanently lost territory to Russia. I don't mm. see any reason to think they're going to get uh, uh, Russia out of something like 20 percent of uh, Ukrainian territory is now in Russia's hands. This whole that whole fiasco was caused by this belief that they could weaken Russia. They could sanction Russia. And what did Biden say? Turn the ruble to rubble. And they were going to destroy mm. Russia's economy, none of which happened. Mm. Uh, they have, however, hurt the economies of other countries. And everything they do to, to try to stop this dynamic ends up hurting the U.S. So countries which were friendly to the U.S., Saudi Arabia, as an example, are now... Um, friendlier to China. China is making inroads to uh, diplomatically. Uh, uh, they may be able to resolve the Saudi attack on Yemen and Iran and Saudi Arabia talking, which are good things, by the way. I think those are, are very positive developments. But it's happened because the United States thought they were going to hurt Russia and that in diminishing Russia they would uh, split Russia from China. Instead, they brought them closer and closer together. So I think the Ukraine debacle is uh, unbelievably still their model for Taiwan, that they're going to use it to do something to China, and that is just not going to happen. So I fear some kind of uh, disaster from this administration. I mean, so many people fear that, I, I believe, that there is an appetite for candidates now emerging in a Democratic mm -hmm. primary who have really capitalized on that kind of uh, anti-war ethos. You can say that, you know, Trump pursued that in bad faith, but that was part of his pitch in 2016. Mm -hmm. I expect it to be a part of his pitch uh, going forward. Ron DeSantis has already kind of tripped up in a Speak of the devil, Tucker Carlson interview in which he kind of tried to have it both ways and said it's just a territorial dispute. So he got the blob bad at him. But at the same time, he was willing to be as critical of Biden's posture on the war as people would have liked. And now you have a candidate like RFK Jr. coming forward who's been really um, centering uh, his objections to the proxy war both before his campaign and now in his initial campaign statements and his website, et cetera. And there seems to be a significant appetite for that sort of thing. Do you think it's relevant? Do you see that as a as a good thing or something that the, the left generally should be indifferent to? I mean, what do you make of the field as it's shaping up? Uh, well, you know, the Republicans all, it's all very predictable mm -hmm. um, that they're all trying to 
I don't know, outright wing each other. I hate China more. No, I hate China more. TikTok is stealing your kids. No, TikTok <laughs> is going to declare war on you. So they all get more and more ridiculous. Uh, the Democrats who've come forward so far, Marianne Williamson, Robert F. Uh, Kennedy Jr., I, I think they know that a lot of Democrats um, uh, want a, a different direction for foreign policy. And it's a good thing that that as a result of their candidacies, that it's something that uh, uh, has to be given attention to. But in general, I just fear that they will ultimately end up telling Democrats to vote for Biden. Um, I, I wish I could believe that there was really going to be some kind of difference emanating from their candidacies, but I, I doubt it because in the past, that's, uh, that's what we've uh, uh, gotten. And I mean, the, the worst example is uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who, you know, got out of the race and then said she loved Joe Biden and his whole family. But now she's turned into a hard right Republican. I mean, who knows? But I guess that's just uh, part of my cynicism. But it's born of uh, um, uh, actual history. So I'm I'm glad they're bringing these issues up. Um, but I would like to see. I personally would like to see more of an uh, an anti an anti imperialist stance, one that uh, that tells people we don't have to do this. And I think that's where millions of people are. I don't think that most Americans, what is it now, $115 billion to Ukraine or mm. to Raytheon and McDonnell Douglas, I guess I should put it that way. But mm. um, but these re these recent leaks say that uh, Zelensky was skimming some off the top for himself and taking mm. too much. But but anyway, that's I'm digressing a little bit. Um, but I think most people want peace. Most people want their government to meet the needs, their everyday needs. There are millions of people struggling but you wouldn't know it because these things are never are are never addressed by our government. Has Biden even given a speech about homelessness? I mean, there are homeless encampments all over the country. I don't think he's ever raised the issue at all. Yeah. So then he, you know, uh, will take a stab at student loan debt, but in a, you know, wishy-washy way where it's bound to be uh, uh, tossed out, all kinds of little phony gestures rather than meeting the needs of the people. I think someone who really uh, spoke about these foreign policy issues in the way I'm describing uh, would get a hearing with the public. I, I think that's true. But yeah, it's, it's uh, interesting. I do think a lot of folks see RFK Jr. as that candidate. Um, and this isn't me talking. This is just me observing. Yeah, no. He and is no way, you know, my candidate. But I think I would be foolish to ignore the energy that's rising up around him in a kind of um, bipartisan, I don't even say bipartisan, because a lot of independents are seemingly very interested in his campaign as well. Mm -hmm. And there is this new news that the Biden administration, or the Democratic Party rather, uh, has said there's no no interest in having a primary debate, uh, that they are not doing primaries this year, that there will not be an opportunity for Marianne or uh, JFK, uh, sorry, RFK Jr., to actually draw any contrast, at least on a debate stage, between themselves and their foreign policy positions and uh, President Biden. What do you make of that turn? Well, I'm not surprised. They, uh, you know, Biden is, we, we started out talking about that. There's n very little enthusiasm for him. People don't want him to run again. But, they're, but the uh, establishment of the Democratic Party are going to stick with him. And the last thing they want are any bumps in the road, any occasions for him to forget where he is. Or, um, uh, but he did that in uh, in 2020, and they stuck with them anyway. But they don't want to take that chance. So they feel, and there was no Democratic incumbent in 2020. Now right. he is the incumbent. So the last thing they want is anybody else uh, uh, getting attention and potentially. Uh, getting buy-in from Democratic Party voters. So, of course, they're not going to uh, to have any debates. But it just shows you that, you know, we talk about democracy. De people use the word democracy all the time now. But that's not democracy to say um, that a president can't, anyone challenging a president can't get a hearing, can't be seen, has to be disappeared. Uh, so that tells you what how the system really works. But it's very unfortunate. I think, 
it's a good it would be a good thing for uh, him to have to face them on the debate stage, but that is something that they see as being too dangerous, and that's why it's not going to happen. Yeah, I agree that it would be an incredibly good thing for him to have to um, face the those two and others that might enter in a debate. Uh, I think it would be great if there were a movement of folks calling for such a thing, that there should be some consequences mm-hmm. politically for the Democratic Party basically shutting down the Democratic process on the left side of the aisle. It does seem to me like there's a tension between a sort of unwillingness for certain leftists to get behind. I mean, you know, there there's, a I think, a legitimate apprehension about the legitimacy of, of these candidates and the extent to which they're going to ultimately sheep herd you back into the Democratic Party and whether or not they are really willing to stick the landing and how strong their leftist bona fides are. I think all of those are legitimate questions to put to any candidate. But there's a tension, I think, between the left not wanting to get burned again, like the way they the way many people felt burned by Bernie mm-hmm. and their ability to, say, create a pressure campaign to challenge the Democratic Party to allow these figures on the, the debate the debate stage. It almost feels like you have to be invested somewhat in at least the relevancy of these candidacies. They're, they're le- you know, the fact that they're to the left of Biden on some issues to mm-hmm. really want to push for a campaign that could expose the Democratic Party for its anti-democratic actions in this moment. But I'm very skeptical that there will be any accountability for the Democratic Party because who would mount such a campaign but the left? And the left seems to be indifferent to the whole project. What do you make of that? Yeah, I I, I think you're right. Um, but if people were ready to make demands, it could be very useful for Biden to be challenged if people weren't afraid. I think this, uh, I, I was referring to black voters, but I think it's true. I think it's especially true of black voters who are are committed to keeping Republicans out of office. But I think it's true for most Democrats at the end of the day, their biggest fear is um, of a Republican victory. And they can very easily be wooed into supporting, uh, especially an incumbent, as, as is the case with Biden. If people had a little more courage, it could be useful for uh, Kennedy and, and Williamson to be running. It could put pressure on Biden. But uh, if if people are going to, you know, get weak at the end of the day and let him off the hook and uh, uh, then decide they have to vote for him no matter what, then uh, it's all for naught. And that's a shame. Why do you think there haven't been more left candidates emerging for third party run, especially earlier in the game? I mean, we've been having this conversation about what to do after Bernie since April whatever the date was, 2020, when Bernie (laughs) dropped out of the race. And there's been all this conversation about how, you know, sheep herding is wrong and you shouldn't push people back into the Democratic Party. I'm lectured about this constantly, even though I was one of the few people who immediately after Bernie dropped out, took a huge hit to my professional reputation and said I would not be voting for Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Still, and and I did not vote for Joe Biden. I very publicly did not vote for Joe Biden. And yet still, as I let's say, try to have a conversation about how to exploit this primary that's going to happen with or without the left to our advantage. This concern about being sheep herded seems to be brought up in a way that seems to preclude any action whatsoever. So the question I'm asking is, okay, I get it. I get the concern about sheep herding. What's the alternative? What's the left's big move four years after Bernie or three years after Bernie dropped out of the race in terms of rallying behind a candidate that they can trust? Who is that candidate, hypothetically? Why? Where are they? Why are they? Why are we not hearing about them? And in the absence of such a candidate, again, what is the downside of dealing with what we have on the table, which is perhaps some flawed candidates, but one that it could at least raise some heighten some of the contrast and failures uh, of the Biden administration? Well, I would say those people who are still sticking with the Democrats, I exited a long time ago. I think that you owe it to yourself to decide who you want to support uh, and that it should not be Biden unless, you know, you you really want him. I don't know how many people really do. (laughs) But at any rate, I I would say, yes, absolutely. You should get behind these people and mean it. And you've got to pressure them, too. You've got to say to them, listen, I'm not going to carry water for you or carry petitions for you or do raise money for you. If you turn around and do the same thing. So um, but I think that goes back to what I was saying before. You can't have uh, successful electoral politics in the absence 
of organizing, mass organizing. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't have electoral politics first. I think that comes after people are mobilized and uh, organized uh, about the issues that are important to them. I think if you had that, you would have people who were better able to really make demands to be serious about them and to be serious about walking away and to be serious about, as you say, you take a hit if you said, no, I'm still not voting for Biden. Well, you're the spoiler. You just wanted Trump, whatever. But uh, I think if people could stiffen their spines, not worry about any of that, because at the end of the day, what do we get? Um, Biden having giving permits for drilling in the Arctic. And I'm like, well, what the hell? Why was it so important for him to win instead of Donald Trump? I think he actually has had more oil drilling on federal lands than Trump did. So uh, I think it's um, people need to stop being so fearful. But I think it's the mobilizing that has to come first because people are not uh going to be that committed in an electoral arena if they're not committed anywhere else. I, I want to ask you about uh, a story. Uh, I know that Glenn Greenwald covered it on his show a while back, and I believe he actually, again, all roads lead back to Tucker Carlson, covered it on uh, Tucker's show recently as well. The latest group of Americans to find their constitutionally protected opinions become felonies are, believe it or not, an organization of black nationalist left-wingers who oppose the war in Ukraine. The DOJ has just charged many in this group with seeking to, quote, sow discord, spread pro-Russia propaganda, and interfere in elections within the United States. Now, there's no evidence they interfere with any election. You're allowed to be pro-Russia. You're allowed to be pro-anything you want in the United States. Saying things that government doesn't like, having unfashionable opinions or opinions that are out of step with Joe Biden's opinions, that is not a crime. You can spread pro-Russia propaganda if you want to. You can spread anti-Russia propaganda if you want to. You can say whatever you want, but not anymore. According to the indictment, the criminals in question, quote, wrote articles that contained Russian propaganda and disinformation. Huh? They also gave speeches and posted videos that annoyed the State Department. Here's one of them. There's a discussion about Russian military border uh, buildup uh, on its border uh, with Ukraine and how this represents a terrible threat uh, uh, to Ukraine by, uh, by Russia. Uh, but there is no acknowledgement of the history uh, that took us to this place, how the U.S. overthrew uh, uh, participated in, in facilitating the overthrow of a government in Ukraine that was friendly to the Soviet Union, nor does it talk about the history of this relationship between Ukraine and, and Russia. This is an ongoing aggression. It did not just start. It's, all, it's been going on for a while, but the U.S. government uh, uh, relies on the ignorance of, of, of the people uh, in this country and much of the world that's facilitated by people like Zuckerberg. So for whatever it's worth, we're not really sure who that guy is. We know he's American. Pretty sure that on a lot of issues, we likely would not agree with him. A lot of what he just said in that video seems to be true. But even if it weren't true, even if he was wrong, it would still be constitutionally protected speech. In a free country, which we had until recently, you are allowed by definition to have dumb opinions. Most of us do, but not anymore. So that man you just saw is facing 10 years behind bars for expressing views about Ukraine that the Biden administration doesn't want to hear. That's terrifying. Does no one else think that's terrifying? It is terrifying. And to that man's credit, whoever he is, he saw it coming. Here he is at a rally last month. They have declared that black people are so stupid that it takes Russians to tell us that we are oppressed. I have never known a moment of black freedom for my entire life. I have never read of a moment since the beginning of a colonial mode of production where black people have been free. And yet they are saying that we are working, we are agents of some foreign power because we say black people must be free. Okay, again, we're not defending that guy because we agree with all of his views. We probably don't. That is totally irrelevant. Whether you agree with what someone is saying has nothing to do with his right to say it. Americans are allowed to say what they think is true, period. 
If they take that right away, you are no longer a citizen, you are a slave. The Justice Department um, has charged a number of Black Americans with conspiring to use uh, illegal, uh, uh, conspiring to use U.S. citizens as legal agents of the Russian government. Another one of these um, stories where these uh, Black leftists are being accused of being in league with the quote-unquote Kremlin to spread uh, kind of um, election propaganda, misinformation, etc. cetera. Uh, have you been following this story? Yeah. Uh, the African People's Socialist Party, they were raided by the FBI last summer. Uh, the indictments, the assumed indictments would come down, and they uh, did last week. And four individuals uh, affiliated with the African People's Socialist Party were uh, uh, indicted. Um, they've been accused of, as I mentioned before, violating the Foreign Agents Registry Act, um, that they were helping. Uh, they had a, a candidate running, I think, a city council seat in, in Florida, St. Petersburg, Florida. But there was a Russian national, it's alleged, who gave the money. And we're told, of course, we're told that the Russians involved are all FSB agents. Now, there's no way of knowing they're in Russia. They'll never face an American courtroom. You don't know if they're FSB agents or if this is some uh, uh, FBI, uh, I'll stick with the initials, BS, um, <laughs> uh, ab about this case. But the bigger issue is this is um, this is part of a, a tradition of attacking the black left. Uh, going back decades, going back to the days of Paul Robeson and having his passport taken of COINTELPRO, the uh, counterintelligence program where the FBI infiltrated uh, the Black Panthers, where actually killed Black Panthers such as uh, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, creating dissension in the movement, destroying that movement, putting people in prison, some of whom are in prison um, decades later. This is a uh, part of uh, of that legacy, and the African People's Socialist Party has to be defended. We have to defend everyone's right to have the opinions they want, to talk to whom they want, to talk to people in another country, even if it's a country declared an adversary, um, because that this is the way to shut down any dissent. It's the way to shut everyone up. And uh, it's something that we have to be very clear in um, in opposing. It's extremely dangerous when people are targeted in this way because it already has a chilling effect. People are joking. You know, I don't want to follow a Russian on Twitter. And it's kind of a joke, but not really. Yeah. Um, people are afraid of having these connections, having these accusations uh, made against them. You should be able to talk to a Russian, visit Russia visit China, visit any place in the world you want to and have any opinions about foreign, U.S. foreign policy, oppose foreign policy, say that another country is right and the U.S. is wrong. You should be able to do all of that without fearing uh, FBI investigation and a federal indictment. You know, some people, you know, Glenn has been, you know, making this argument that the fact that this kind of a case gets a hearing in him, kind of his section of the Internet which many leftists even have declared to be no longer on the left. I mean, obviously, uh, Glenn, friend of the show, is a very polarizing figure. But the case that he's been making is that, you know, whatever you want to say, and there's plenty to say about Tucker Carlson and the like, that but for those platforms, certain stories like this would die in darkness. You made this point earlier about why there has been so little in the way of consequences for the Democratic Party for ignoring various black uh, relevant issues, whether it's George Floyd justice and policing or student debt cancellation or, you know, getting any any flack for that lead to call. This seems to be another instance where you can fully and we covered this last summer on the show. You can fully kind of uh, arrest an elderly member of an, the African Socialist Party, have him sitting on the curb doing a perp walk in the middle of the day, all of these kinds of things. And it really isn't a bleep. You're not hearing no. Apologies if I missed it, but you're not hearing Roland Martin talk about it. You're not hearing Don Lemon, who also got the axe today, <laughs> talk about it. You know, you're not hearing Joanne Reed talk about these kinds of things. So, you know, I mean, 
I, I, I think a lot of folks are concerned about being a useful idiot for someone like Tucker Carlson to say, oh, you did a couple of good stories and we're supposed to look the other way over X, Y, and Z. But how do you manage the reality of the media ecosystem we're in, where a lot of folks feel like, hey, I got to take what I can get where I can get it? Well, I, you know, but that that attitude is the losing attitude that uh, uh, you can't step out. You know, if you know, some people, uh, you mentioned some names of people, they're very established, they make a lot of money, uh, life is good for them, they're not going to step out of line, but there's no reason why the rest of us have to uh, follow uh, follow along. We refer to them in, at Black Agenda Report as the Black misleadership class, which mm-hmm. is not just politicians, it's people in the media, it's people at uh, so-called civil rights organization, it's the plethora of uh, people who I mentioned who were created as a buffer class in order to blunt black politics. And the rest of us need to be brave. We need to be brave about so many things. When the FBI comes after a, a, a black organization, a left black left organization, we have to call BS. That's the first thing that we have to do. We have to know our history. We have to know that nothing good comes from it. And, uh, you know, as far as Tucker Carlson, then say everything true about him. Yes, he gave this one a hearing. Yes, he allowed this one on his show. But yes, he wants to have a war uh, against China. Say it all. Just tell Mm. people everything that he and others like him have ever done. Take him out of the equation. He's not the issue here. The issue is whether... We have any rights um, that the, we're supposed to have in this country if the state wants to attack us. And when that happens, it has to be clear and unequivocal. And I'm very disappointed, not surprised, but disappointed that a lot of people who are supposedly so progressive, even people who may criticize Biden, are silent about these indictments. It tells you where they really stand. Um, that they they aren't willing to stand. Um, everybody takes a hit if you're if you're serious, if you're committed, let this be the place where you take a hit. But the next one is gonna be you. Uh, if people can't remember anything else when you don't stand up, when you don't defend these people who are under attack from the state, it becomes easier for people to be gotten over anything. And um, uh, it could be someone in contact with the Russian. It could be anything. I mean, this is also a legacy of Russiagate. And Russiagate is a story about the Democrats, uh, the Democratic Party establishment, who used the surveillance state to try to undo Trump's candidacy when all they really needed to do was have a decent get out the vote effort. But that's a whole other story. Um, But uh, Russiagate was engineered by the Democratic Party. And they're at it again. So, of course, the progressives in Congress, my, you know, favorite uh, targets for derision, who never say anything important about anything, of course, they're not going to say anything. But even other people who are supposed to be progressives, who uh, uh, may have defended other people, have been conspicuous, conspicuously silent uh, in uh, uh, regarding this case. Yeah, I mean, in the wake of Marjorie Taylor Greene's argument that we should defund uh, the FBI, I made the case that as wackadoo as she is, you know, if they, if she wants to create this opening, then the leftists in Congress should propose their own legislation to make whatever reforms the left would make to those institutions um, instead of letting her kind of occupy the oxygen for a movement that has a lot of energy on the left and the right in terms of the kind of the dis- disaffected sections of our politics. And it's a weird, it's a weird place to be in. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm really curious about your perspective as someone who's been writing about these issues for some time, particularly from a black lens, because it does seem to me like black people are in many ways, the kind of canary in the coal mine and in American mm-hmm. politics and for the democratic party in terms of coalitions that could possibly be moved in a way that makes the democratic party pay attention because they can't win without black voters and black voters vote as a block. I mean, you might say they can't win without women or they can't vote win without Latinos or they can't win without any number of other people, but those groups don't vote as a block in the way that black voters do. Um, That there is an opportunity there, right? There is an opportunity to use that as a leverage point 
which makes it that much more galling that not a single person in the so-called Black misleadership class ever seems interested in the least in doing that sort of thing. And, you know, you mentioned the fact that, you know, we don't have, you know, people aren't organized enough to kind of make their political foothold necessary. But that seems to me to be sort of a, or that, that political um, agency, powerful, I should say. But that seems to be this kind of circular kind of thing that comes up again and again on the show. Well, we shouldn't really invest, we can't really invest that much in politics. We don't have the organizing mechanisms together to actually run a candidate or to, um, you know, withhold labor in a way that's meaningful or to have a general strike, et cetera. Uh, but also we're not going to, you know, it's like, so then, so what happens first? Also, the the labor unions are captured and um, there's, you know, business labor unionism and, uh, you know, they're not willing, the big powerful unions aren't willing to take a hit to the coffers and actually do a wildcat strike. I mean, it's, it's around and around and around. And it feels to me on some level like it's it's a great line of argument to get people demobilized and disaffected. Right. So what's well, the offering? <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's the, the popular mobilization, which can impact all the things you mentioned. Um, the uh, scoundrel politicians or the scoundrel labor union leaders. Uh, I, I, I go back to that. That's what's always moved the needle is the popular action um, uh, first. And uh, I think if we keep that in mind and talk about how to do that, and I think that's the hard part, because uh, it's been a, it's been a long time since that happened. So the people who've done that, if they're still around, they're older. They're people who uh, who want to really, really want to see change, are very serious about it, but don't have um, uh, any guidance about how to make that happen. That is um, uh, the thing, I, if I was going to say there was anything that's lacking, I think that's it. We saw a glimmer of it three years ago with the protests after George Floyd was killed. I think, I think it petered out, I think because it was a presidential election year, I think uh, that took a lot of the oxygen out of the room, unfortunately, but that tells us on the positive side, there are millions of people who do want change they just need to know how to do it. And uh, that's not an easy question to answer, but I think in just pondering the question, I think we will come up with some answers. But, but Margaret, it's, it's, it's 2023. It's, it's time again. Yes, it is. It's always time. And, 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 we're, and we're saying, what we're basically saying is, at a certain point, it seems to me like, even people on the left are similarly at fault and to blame for the failure to have changed a single thing about the dynamic between then and now. I got to tell you, a lot of folks accuse me of being overly invested in electoralism or that, you know, I guess the line should be that one one should ignore the fact of politics happening around you, not try to use it to your advantage, that sometimes somehow it's like a, a valor issue, like I'm a better leftist to, to not care at all what's happening in a in in the in national election cycle that is going to have an effect on all of our lives. But it's not like there's an alter it's not like there's an alternative place to put one's energy. People say organize. Okay. I'll have organizers on. We'll talk about I'm so excited about what Shama Sawant is doing with Workers Strike Back and I think that her kind of realization that there's a kind of limits to what can be achieved in the political realm and that a shift toward organizing is useful and helpful is great too. But I'm also thinking about conversations that I've had with, for example, Ralph Nader, someone who does come from an earlier generation of politics, who talked about, you know, the ways that they used to exploit political stunts to try to get headlines and to create awareness about various issues. You know, and, and I think about the moment we're in, I think about what 2020 was like. I think about you saying, you know, people weren't willing to do much with that because it was election year. And it's like, are we really saying that in the year of our Lord 2023, there's not a single influential black person in America who's willing to say, it doesn't matter if the other side wins, you absolutely cannot vote for, for Joe Biden. Or here are the following conditions for my participation in the Democratic election, in the, in the national election this year. You're telling me that in the entire country, there's not, you know, there's not a an old guard figure. There's not an Angela Davis. <laughs> well, let me. There's not uh, a Brittany Plaskett. 
There's just, not a. Well, let, me, let me just say Angela There's Davis. There's not a Cornell always, West. <laughs> Angela Davis is voting for Democrats. I'm not sure she's the, uh, is always I, telling I mean, us I, we have to. I don't know I, if she's the best I think, name. I, no, but, but that's I, why I I'm see. bringing her up. I certainly don't yeah. think Brittany Plaskett is a revolutionary in, you know, in this mode either. But that's exactly my point. Yeah. Like, to the extent that those people are also part of the problem, that doesn't seem to be a conversation that's very widely had either. I mean, do do people like, let me ask you this. Do people like um, the reporters at the Grio or some of these more mainstream black publications, uh, the, Roland Tom- the Roland Martins of the world, ever reach out to black agenda report or open themselves up to dialogue with black leftists? No. No, they don't, which is fine, actually, because if they did, it would be a very bad sign to me. So that's fine with me. I'm good with that. I think there's a couple of problems. I think it's electoral politics and it's the, uh, what do they call it? The nonprofit industrial complex, the NGOs. There are all these people lurking out there. So when uh, Occupy, uh, Occupy Wall Street ended, where did people go? They were offered good jobs. They got a lot of money. I think we need people who I, I think people have to realize that reformism isn't going to cut it. Uh, we have to have revolutionary stances, and I think sometimes that word is uh, scary to people. Uh, but we see what happens with the so-called progressives who know what to say. They know what people want, but they get into office and they're, you know, telling you Joe Biden has to. Uh, break a railroad worker strike. So we know what doesn't work. We know electoral politics is the end. It's not the beginning. And these NGOs, I think, are also a very, very big problem. There uh, exists this realm of people who have money to give. But I, I think we've got to go back to some of that old school, um, some yeah. of that old school organizing and thing. see that. Participating in electoral politics and exploiting electoral politics are not the same thing. So no. someone like Jose Vega, who keeps going to these town hall meetings, et cetera, and making a stink, yeah. loudly asking questions, confronting politicians about their position on Ukraine or what have you. Oh, is this the lecture hall with Seymour Hirsch? I, I just I'm looking for the one with Seymour Hirsch because it's a policy and press hall event. So. Shouldn't we be talking about the Nord Stream since that's the biggest story of the century? And you guys, you know, I mean, you have the executive editor of the New York Times there who came out with a phony story to try and block Seymour Hirsch. It just it's just kind of funny how that happened. You know, I mean, did you even acknowledge Seymour Hirsch? All of you are executive editors of papers that broke Pentagon, Me Lai, Watergate. Is this the same papers or not? I mean, is there anything you've gotten right? in the last 20 years or am i mistaken about that i mean it's just kind of funny because iraq wrong syria wrong russiagate really wrong okay i mean the list goes on and on so the last thing you could do to try and actually fix your reputation is acknowledge that through leaks we had to find out that zelensky was going to bomb moscow on the anniversary i mean if you're so impartial shouldn't you at least say right that zelensky was going to bring us on the verge of world war three that seems pretty fair while julian assange rots in prison all of you got you know fat checks because he's in jail for doing your job. And you know what? Tucker Carlson ain't no Seymour Hirsch. But he did something you guys are scared to do. Speak the truth and actually be critical of the war. Which is why he was actually fired from Fox. Because you are all cowards. Every single one of you. None of you have actually had any relevancy. And you know what? The mainstream press is now dying. Nobody's ever going to listen to you again. You have no credibility with the public. The only people who care about what you have to say are elite assholes who have nothing productive to say anymore. And it's dying off. So will you at least say something either about Nord Stream or Ukraine or the fact that Zelensky brought us to the verge of World War III and the only reason we knew about that was through leaks? I'm, go ahead. It's a free speech event, right? You guys are the press. Let's say something here. Mr. Khan, come on. You know, you're the executive head of the New York Times, you know? I'm just trying to get into some good trouble here, man. Woo. Listen, Karen, get out of my face for a second. I got to talk to these gentlemen. Well, I just want to hear what they have to say. Go ahead. I'm done. 
Wait your turn. You're not going to tell him to. Come. Wait your turn. You could you could project if we can't. I would just say I think it's important to hear everybody's point of view. Yeah. So thank you. All right. I do think that we need to give uh, our moderator a chance to ask one of the questions. We're on the verge of World War III. Right, We're not doing that. We're not doing that. Thank you. Let's go. Really? Let's go. You. Say so something about this not. bombing. Sir, we blew up the sir. Nord Stream sir. pipeline. Let's go. Let's go. Listen, don't Let's stand go. there while there are people rotting in Let's prison. Go. Nobody said anything about Uhuru, right? The socialists who are in jail for being critical of this war? God damn it! Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. At least say something about the people in jail for being critical of this war. They don't deserve to be in prison right now. You know, when I say do something with the fact of there being a Democratic primary, that's what I'm talking about. In a debate between these uh, challengers and Biden is one of those uh, would be the highest profile of opportunities to confront him on some of his positions. Right. Much more high profile than what Jose is able to manage, you know, Godspeed, you know, <laughs> without work. But the point of the matter is, you know, these things are happening whether or not you like it. So how do you continue to draw those kind of contrasts? The point you made earlier about the fact that Biden could have granted sick leave by executive order. I remember some of the progressives kind of bringing that up in the immediate aftermath as, well, don't be too mad at him yet. He might just do it. But like there was no pressure to continue to pressure him to do that. They're, they didn't continue that call for the weeks and months after the strike. And it, co- there was also no pressure on those elected officials to keep saying what they'd already admitted they know, which is that Biden is making a choice here not to grant those people sick leave at the same time that he's tweeting last week that he's the greatest union president of all time. So is it that I have trust and confidence in the squad members? No, but I think the fact that the squad members said X, Y, and Z and have admitted on the record that they know Biden can do something and are choosing not to do something means there's an obligation to pressure them in turn. Do you know what I mean? I I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, if you're, if you're going to um, delve into electoral politics, let's talk about primaries. They need to have people run against them. I mean, if if I lived in one of their districts, I'd run against them. I'd run against one of them. It's just, I mean, it's its just embarrassing that these people are allowed to, I don't know, to carry on this sham and this and this scam. But to your, your larger point about where to begin, I think it's multifaceted. I think, first of all, as individuals, as humans, some of us have a greater inclination to do one thing than another. So there are mm-hmm. some people who will be uh, more likely to be involved in electoral politics and somebody else in uh, 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 community uh, organizing or any kind of organizing. I think that's fine um, for people to involve themselves in uh, where they where they have the, the, the most inclination to do that. I think it can all happen, but I, I, I really believe that um, uh, people have to, if, for example, you asked me if you named some people and said, do they ever reach out to Black Agenda Report? And I said, no. And that's fine. I don't want them to, actually. I, I you don't, don't think, think that it would be beneficial to have a Black Agenda Report perspective on a show like the Grio or on. Um... Yeah, but then they wouldn't be the Grio anymore. <laughs> if they had us. And then what would we be? Would we be asked to change our politics? Uh, well, no, I mean, to go on a show as a guest hardly means you have, you know, if they have sure. you on, they have you on. If they don't want to have you on twice because of what you right. said when you were on, that's but a different what is it, story. But what does it say that they never ask? I mean, I think they probably don't want to, they they know, no, it's like, no, no, thank you. So I, well, I okay. got that. It, it could mean that. But, you know, my experience, and maybe this is a little patronizing to say, but there's a lot of folks who just have no idea what the political, oppor- like the political options are out there for black mm-hmm. folks it's been so narrowly defined for us what our politics should be and what right. it means to be what black politics means in the united states i i happen to know personally as a, a socialist uh you know a leftist that was kind of raised in a socialist commune situation who's very high on the staff of a very prominent black magazine and they have to tell a certain you know they they they're delicate with it but they get their stuff in there and they get their stuff 
you know, people like Mark Lamont, Mark, Mark Lamont Hill, who's been such an advocate for Palestinian rights, have had prominent positions on some of these black talk shows. Uh, the black... I've been on this show. I've been on this show. It's All right. So there's... Show. Yeah, I and, and others who are affiliated with Black Agenda Report. But uh, I think that's... Uh, um, I think that's more of of, of an exception. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, but the the issue. Well, there are many issues here, aren't there? Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that for us, we have to. It's very important for us to have a very principled line. And if somebody reaches out, they can reach out. But I I find that when people don't, it's because they they really don't want to. They just don't want to go there. Uh, and that's okay. That's all right. Um, you know, there are many people who do want to switch. I'm talking to you right now. So uh, I do think that that is important. But I, 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 I sort of dread this election year, just to, to sum up on this question about <laughs> election. I really do. It's like, oh, my God, we're going to go through the quadrennial uh, um, uh, uh, hoax. But, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned someone who is, you know, disrupts events and all that can be okay but you know then they have a political connection that i'm not crazy about um but i think the uh we have to start um by uh by being more courageous and about defending people Def i mentioned the african people socialist party right. or people who strike against you know, Starbucks, and then they close the store. Well, don't go there anymore. I mean, you know, that could seem like a small thing, but uh, I I do believe that we have to have a revolutionary stance. And I, I say revolutionary because I think the word conjures up a lot of things that uh, uh, people uh, may find scary, but uh, we don't have to go along. We don't have to. We cannot keep going along. We have some serious existential crises going on, a multitude of them. We have a, an administration that has it at the brink of war with other nuclear powers. We have every, every piece of information about the climate tells us that things are getting worse. Uh, people are, millions of people are struggling. And I do think we, we know what doesn't work and getting sucked into a, another uh, presidential e election year without looking at what's happened in the past, in the very recent, that's happening right now, is something that just is not excusable. So if zero leftists ever tweeted about or acknowledged in any way that there was a Democratic primary happening, do you imagine that there would be kind of a material difference in their investment in other things organizing that, that that there would be a real difference in outcomes in a world where we all just said collectively let's show some discipline no one's going to tweet about the primaries nobody's going to tweet about any primary candidates we're not going to notice if uh marianne's name is left off of a list of of polling results we're not going to opine on whether or not the democratic party is shutting down the prime uh, the debate schedule just we're not even going to engage we're going to let them do no, their thing and we're going to do our thing I, I wouldn't say that that has to happen. No, okay. I, I, I don't think that would be useful at all. I think people need that information. I think it's very, you know, those of us uh, who are in media, it's very, people depend on us for information. And I think it's very important that we point out those things. I, I think that would be a missed opportunity. And I don't think that would be very mature uh, politically. Uh, but I, but there comes a, a point where there has to be some confrontation along with that. And uh, uh, should these candidates do what past candidates have done, then I think it's important to point that out too. And uh, you, that, it, sorry, I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. I mean, do you imagine? Do you fantasize about who is the type of candidate you could get behind? Uh Yes, I do. I mean, I know. Do you have a name people, in mind? Uh, I I can't name an individual. I know what I would like to see. Um, I would like to see independent politics, independent of the duopoly, um, uh, an anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist candidate, and that means very many things. Someone who would talk about the uh, the terrible um, the things that that 
could be fixed, but that aren't because of, you know, you could call it austerity, you could call it any number of things. But to really point out the um, uh, what the ruling class does, a, a serious class analysis. And I think these are things that people can get behind. I, I don't think I don't think it's true that people don't, well, they can't understand capitalism and socialism. Yes, I think so. People know that their wa real wages haven't gone up for years. They know that the rent goes up, but their wages don't. They see the homeless people. They know how much money uh, goes to Ukraine or whatever other foreign adventure is taking place in the world. And people could get behind that. Now, uh, someone who I could really get behind would be, uh, frankly, in a dangerous situation or would just be ignored. So it would be um, a, a heavy lift. Now, can you compromise? Yes, you can. I think compromise can be principled. Uh, but unfortunately, I have found that what is called compromise is just acquiescing. So that's that's not what I'm talking about. Um, but Look, uh, yeah, <laughs> I hate to say I, I hear myself and I keep sounding like some kind of RFK Jr. fangirl, which is not my intention. But based on what you just said, uh -huh. there there's a lot of what he's been talking about. He's been doing that kind of Bernie style uh, capital uh, socialism for the rich, rugged individualism for the poor lines, being very explicit, very strong and very adversarial with respect to calling out uh, corruption in the swamp, the captured nature of the the Democratic Party, the anti-war message. I mean, that that is what is frustrating to me, I think, sometimes in these conversations. You know, there is this idea that so many people who did get behind Bernie. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think people should be honest with themselves. If someone said, I got behind Bernie, I was disappointed. And so now I'm just not doing this anymore. OK, I, I like I can feel how I feel about that. But like, I respect that position. All right. But I'm getting a lot of, um, you know, there are these reasons why I got behind Bernie, but not these other people and that to me don't really stack up because there are ways in which some of the current candidates are more aggressive and more critical of Bernie. And there's some ways in which you might not trust them because they don't have the same record as Bernie as being around in Congress, being as adversarial as he has for all the decades. But in terms of their con contemporary rhetoric are there and are saying a lot of what you're saying. Right. Um, so then what is the re reasoning for not saying, hey, I'm not going to knock doors for them. I'm not going to give money to them. But it's a good thing that this person is running and the left should be behind them in, in so far as advocating for a debate to happen. And so far as, you know, advocating for the media not to black them out, et cetera. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm for that. Absolutely. I don't I, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned about this. Uh, I don't know. It seems like people are are uh, and it's the part of the nature of the system are looking for, you know, somebody to come along and 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 uh and save us but i i i i i say this scrutinize people scrutinize everyone who comes forward don't compromise your principles i think it it is a good thing for someone to come along who says i'm a a, a democrat who says i differ from the party in these ways and for people to give them attention i think that's only that is a good thing uh, I don't advocate for, um, uh, you know, not saying anything. I'm obviously offering critique, but offering support and analysis as well, because we need you. You're not going to have any analysis if everybody stays out and just says, I, there's nothing more I can do. I'm just going to throw up my hands. I, you mm -hmm. know, I'm not going through this, what, whatever, all, all of the things you just said. Uh, I don't think that it's apathy. I don't think apathy yeah. uh, helps, even if it's apathy that comes from past experience or apathy based on critiques of the Democratic Party. Uh, I don't think that's a, a, a helpful thing. I would have to look at him and anybody else very closely before I supported them. I, you know, I take a, a, a much harder um, uh, line. But uh, so so by all means, go, you know, go ahead. Don't I would just say this. Don't let him or anybody don't let him off the hook. If uh, they don't meet your uh, uh, political standards, I would hope that everybody has those. Um, then you should say so. 
Or, I mean, you could, and it could be, you know, a mixture of things. You like this about the person, but you don't like that about the person. And, and you know, perhaps you make a decision to support them, um, uh, to support them anyway. So I, I wouldn't tell people not to be involved. I would, I would not say that. But yeah, I remember Bernie, people saying, you know, Bernie's been selling on Assange, but I'm gonna, I support him anyway in 2020. Or Bernie, I don't agree with Bernie on Israel, but I support him anyway because of the overwhelming good and you know, it's it's interesting to me that for whatever reason, and this is not a critique, but that people have a lot of people have moved away from that. And I think some of it is because they just got burned badly, and they're like, I, I made I those compromises, so. and for what? I I think so too, and then and that's a there's a lesson there. It's like, what will you compromise about? Um, you know, for some people, um, you know, ultimately, if there are too many compromises, then that person clearly is not someone you should be. Um, uh, supporting, but um, I, I think it, I think there was a lot of uh, there, as, as you know, there was a lot of disappointment uh, after 2016, and then again after 2020, uh, and and at the end of the day, you end up with uh, you know uh, with with uh, you know with Jim Crow Joe um, <laughs> Biden, and the fact that Bernie will you know defends him all uh, defended him then defends him now i i yeah. think that is the bigger reason that people feel burned not just yeah. that he stepped out but he stepped out and defended him and continues to um to uh defend him and defend uh many of his policies which have been so disastrous i think that's uh the the thing that uh has turned people um off the most that he didn't even say you know, I no, I'm not defending you. I'm not going to say anything. But that he feels the need to go all in mm -hmm. for um, uh, Joe Biden. I think that is uh, that's still a huge problem for a lot of people. But you know, it's not surprising either. He's a senator after all. He worked with Biden for many years, so it's not it's not really um, that shocking. But that's the problem of getting behind people who are already in politics. And, you know, the, the beauty of uh, somebody coming along, whoever that is, excuse me, who's not already an elected official, um, that I think is um, uh, something that is um, that's beneficial. So I would say to everybody, scrutinize people, keep them honest, be honest with yourself. Don't go back on anything that... Um, you know, is very important, you know, where I suppose where you compromise or, or uh, you have to get something for that's the other thing. You've got to get something for your compromise. It can't sure. just be that um, uh, I'm going to overlook this and I'm going to overlook that. It's going to be, well, what do I get? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you want this thing that I don't want. What do I get out of it? Yeah. What are you going to stick with? Where is your conviction? Um and I think that's also part of it, too. And I think that's part of the uh, bravery that I've been talking about and that you don't end up being a chump every four years. Nobody wants Trump, to be a... <laughs> famously an outsider. <laughs> no, you know? no, chump. I said chump, not Trump. Oh, oh sorry. Trump. I said for years. Yeah. Sorry. I, I have that on my mind because you said, you know, outside an outsider would be nice. I think a lot of folks thought that about Donald Trump. And I think that a lot of folks think that about some combination of Marianne and RFK Jr. And people thought that about Obama, that he was a relative yeah. outsider. I mean, this is constantly the dynamic, for better or for worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it was, I think we have to depend on ourselves. I think that is, I, I think we, as the, we the people, we the people, it sounds corny, we have <laughs> a lot more influence than we think we do. And what will the tipping point be? I guess that's the thing I'm, I don't know what the tipping yeah. point will be uh, where people just say, screw it, to hell with it, to hell with all of it and act independently because that is the thing um, that can turn um, uh, electoralism around. But I also think we need to study, you know, who knows how, I mean, revolutions happen different ways and in different places. But I think we need revolution. And it can't just be a marketing word, revolution. Mm. Um, I think it's got to be something that people are really ready to do. Uh, yeah. Because um, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what are you going along with? Um, 
and I think we're we're at that point um, where that's a very serious question. Uh, the nibbling around the edges, I think we've we're past that point. It's it's not going to work. But the issue is how to get that done and how to get people mobilized in uh, movements, which have always been the thing that have brought politicians. When they do things we want them to do, it's always because they've been forced to do by people who some work in the system, but I think more of them working outside. I, I believe that's still the issue. Well, I think that's a really great place to end this. Margaret Kimberly, thank you so much for joining me. Where can people find more of you and your work on the internet? Sure, blackagendareport.com. We publish uh, every Wednesday. We have a podcast, Black Agenda Radio, every Friday. My uh, handle is Freedom Ride uh, Blog on Twitter. And uh, I look forward to seeing more people. Terrific. Thank you all for listening. This has been a great show. Thank you for subscribing, supporting the podcast at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast if you're a subscriber. If you're not, thank you for just giving thumbs up on YouTube videos and subscribing to the Bad Faith YouTube channel. That's incredibly helpful. Uh, take care of yourselves. And as always, keep it safe. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.